In Unit 2B, we're going to continue our conversation about motion by building off of the constant velocity model with a new idea of acceleration. Previously, we talked about constant velocity motion, where an object was moving with the same speed the entire time throughout its motion. It never sped up or slowed down. But now we introduce the idea of acceleration, which is a change in an object's speed. Here in this motion map, you can see one of the objects, the red object, has a constant velocity to the right. The size of its velocity arrow never changes at any of the timestamps. The cyan particle on top has an acceleration. It starts off with no speed, and then its speed gradually increases throughout the motion until it catches up with the red particle and passes it. Much like the velocity was the change in position over a change in time, the acceleration is a change in velocity over a change in time. This means that we'll have units of meters per second on top in this numerator, and we will have units of seconds on bottom. So we'll have meters per second over seconds, and when we simplify that, we get units of meters per second squared for acceleration. And acceleration is a vector, which means it matters which way it's pointing. If you're accelerating to the right or the left, that might have a different outcome on your motion. And now that we have this new idea of acceleration, we have to add it into our motion map somehow. This double-headed arrow above the particle represents its acceleration. You'll always draw the acceleration as a double-headed arrow slightly offset from where the particle is. This two-headed arrow is used to distinguish it from the single-headed arrow of the velocity. I mentioned that acceleration is a vector, which means it matters what way we're moving and what way we're accelerating. There are four different outcomes that we can have with different combinations of directions of velocity and acceleration. We could be moving to the right with a velocity that's in the positive direction and accelerating to the right with an acceleration in the positive direction. And this would cause us to speed up and go faster and faster to the right. On the other hand, we could be traveling to the right with a positive velocity and experience a negative acceleration, which would be slowing us down. It would be counteracting the motion that's moving to the right with the velocity, and instead the acceleration would take away speed. You might call this a deceleration when the acceleration is in the opposite direction of the motion. You could also imagine traveling to the left with a negative velocity, but experiencing a positive acceleration to the right. That would cause the motion to be slowing down again because the acceleration is in the opposite direction of the velocity. And finally, we could have a negative velocity, meaning we're moving to the left, and experiencing a negative acceleration, meaning that the velocity is getting larger and larger and larger in that negative direction because the acceleration is going to add to the velocity when they're in the same direction. Here are some GIFs to help you see these different types of motion. This is situation A, positive velocity and positive acceleration. Here's situation B with a positive velocity and a negative acceleration. You'll notice that if the acceleration continues throughout the entire motion, that the object ends up going the opposite direction and starting to speed up. So it will enter into another regime of motion when it changes its direction. Here we have a negative velocity and a positive acceleration. Again, we see it change direction. And here we have a negative velocity and a negative acceleration. This is basically the opposite of what we saw in, in the first example for A. This lets us simplify our equation for acceleration, which says delta V over delta T. If we mathematically rearrange this, we get a very useful kinematic equation, which will tell us the velocity of an object after some amount of time given its acceleration and its initial velocity. Here's another useful kinematic equation that we might end up using depending on which variables you are given. You might want to end up using this one. And in order to summarize everything that we've learned in Unit 2A and 2B, these are all of the different equations that we have, and these are in the OpenStax College Physics textbook as well. Number one is used for objects that experience constant velocity motion. Number three is used for objects that are experiencing an acceleration, and you need to figure out the new velocity. Number four is a position update equation that can be used to solve for the position for an object that is experiencing an acceleration, a non-constant velocity. And number five is useful in cases where you're given the acceleration, displacement, and change in velocity, but not given time. Recall from unit 2a where the slope of the position versus time graph gave us the velocity within a given time interval. Now our slope in our position versus time graph is changing. It's giving us a non-linear relationship, which means that there will be a changing slope throughout the entire time period of this motion.
We can see this show up in our velocity because if the slope of this position versus time graph is getting steeper and steeper, the velocity will be getting greater and greater. The slope of the velocity versus time graph gives you the value of acceleration. And much like previously where we had the area under a velocity graph giving us the displacement or change in position, we can take the area under an acceleration graph to give us a change in velocity over a given time period. So here we have an example of an object that is experiencing an acceleration. It starts off slow and continues moving faster and faster. We see a quadratic shape come out in the po position versus time graph, a linear relationship in velocity versus time, and a constant relationship in acceleration versus time. This gives us the generic math model and specific math model that's shown here for this particular example, and I've shown the verbal models that you would do too to talk about the intercept and slope and what they mean. So now let's look back on the example that we brought up in the very beginning of this lecture where we had one object moving at a constant velocity and another one increasing its velocity over time. We can compare the position versus time graph to analyze and interpret when these two objects will end up crossing, which is at eight seconds. So all of that motion applies in the horizontal situation. That's one dimensional motion. But we also could do this in the vertical direction. There's nothing saying that we can't use these equations for the y direction instead of the x direction. So if we're talking about vertical position, we will denote that with the letter y instead of x. One example where you'll see vertical motion is in an object that is experiencing free fall. That means gravity is the only thing acting on it. We're not gonna worry about wind resistance or anything else for an object that's in free fall. And when an object is in free fall, it experiences an acceleration due to gravity equal to negative 9.8 meters per second squared. In the vertical case, we do not have constant velocity because we have an acceleration. Therefore, we can't use kinematic equation 1 and 2. But we can use kinematic equations 3, 4, and 5 to solve for a variable of interest. Here we see an object that is thrown up with a velocity of 20 meters per second, and eventually it experiences an acceleration due to gravity downward that causes it to come back down the way it came. We can see the graph of the y position versus time the velocity in the y direction versus time and the acceleration in the y direction versus time. The only reason why it seems like certain objects fall faster than others is because there's wind in the way when we experience them in our everyday life. If we were to go up to the moon and drop a hammer and a feather next to each other, we would see that because there's no air in the way, no wind resistance, that the acceleration due to gravity would act the same on both of these objects. Here we see an astronaut dropping a hammer and a feather on the moon. You'll notice that they hit the ground at the same time because they experience the same acceleration due to gravity, negative 9.8 meters per second squared, when you're on Earth. So we spoke about motion in the x direction. That's one dimension. We spoke about motion in the y direction. That's another dimension. And if we treat those separately, we can just use everything that we've learned up to this point to just talk about motion left and right or talk about motion up and down. But we can also talk about both of these motions happening at the same time, and that's called two-dimensional motion. For example, if you were to walk northeast in a city, you would see that you'd have to walk nine blocks east and five blocks north, and the actual amount of distance that you covered in this path is different than the true direction between those two points. Here we have motion in the x direction and motion in the y direction. This means that we can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the true distance between these points, the true displacement. We see that if we were to take the route that a bird or helicopter were to fly, that it would actually only be 10.3 blocks, whereas if we were to take the route according to these two separate directions or components, we actually walked 9 blocks and 5 blocks, giving us a total distance of 14, whereas our displacement was only 10.3. Right now what we're talking about is vectors. Vectors are really important because they worry about direction two-dimensional motion, we're going to have to be very careful to keep our vectors straight. We have to know when we're talking about a quantity that's in the x direction or the y direction. And so if we have a vector, we will denote it when we're writing it down with an arrow above the variable name. If we're talking about the magnitude, I'll often write that as the absolute value of the vector. And the direction of a vector, since we're talking about two-dimensional motion now, will have to be denoted with some angle theta, which is given with respect to an axis. This allows us to separate a motion that's in two dimensions into its components. It's, it's motion in just the x direction or it's motion in just the y direction. Here, the x component is to the right, the y component is up, and the vector, the resultant vector between those two displacements, 
is given as a straight path, and often I'll use the letter S to denote motion in two directions. What's really important about two-dimensional motion is that we recognize that motion in the horizontal direction is completely independent from motion in the vertical direction. These two don't affect each other. If an object's accelerating to the right, that has no bearing on if it is gonna move up or down. If we were to have a vector that is up and to the right, we can figure out the length of the component vectors, the vertical and horizontal vectors, by using trigonometry. Here, we can set up a relationship given the angle theta and this right triangle. The adjacent leg to theta would use a cosine function to solve for that. The opposite leg from theta would use a sine function to solve for that. And we would multiply the value of the resultant vector by its respective trig function. So you'll need to know about sine and cosine, and you'll also need to know about the Pythagorean theorem and inverse trigonometric functions. This inverse tangent function could be used to solve for the angle theta if you knew the opposite and adjacent leg values. You need to be careful when you're using this because it might depend on what direction your vector points. If you are in the first and fourth quadrant, this formula will work every time. But if not, you may need to add or change the formula depending on which quadrant you're in. Here's a summary of the four trig functions that you need to know for this class. Just as a little bit of a review, here we can talk about sine, cosine, and tangent, which talks about the relationship between different legs of a triangle. If we were gonna add two vectors together, since motion is independent in the x direction and the y direction, really we need to only add together the x components of each vector separately, and then add the y components of each vector separately. This will give us a resultant vector in the horizontal direction and a resultant vector in the vertical direction. We can use the Pythagorean theorem to determine the total magnitude of the resultant vector, and we can use an inverse tangent to figure out the angle. The most famous form of two-dimensional motion is projectile motion. This is an object flying through the air. Here we can see an example of projectile motion. In these balls on the left, those are dropping and direction or motion in the y direction and we always keep these variables separate you'll never add a y variable to an x variable in projectile motion the acceleration in the x direction will always be zero the acceleration in the y direction will always be negative 9.8 meters per second squared and for projectile motion we have a summary of all of the kinematic equations that you would need to know in horizontal motion we can use the constant velocity equations from unit 2a in the vertical motion portion, we use acceleration motion from unit 2b. Here, once again, we can see an object that has the same horizontal velocity the whole time. These arrows aren't getting larger or smaller. But the vertical velocity is changing over time. It's getting larger in the negative direction. The resultant velocity is a combination of the vertical component and the horizontal component. So we can draw a motion map here in two dimensions at the same time. For an object that's shot upward with 20 meters per second vertical velocity and to the right 5 meters per second horizontal velocity, we can see that the vertical velocity is going to get smaller and then negative over time, whereas the, ver the horizontal velocity stays constant throughout the entire motion. I placed a double-headed arrow here to represent the acceleration at each different timestamp. And here at the top, you'll see almost all of the motion is only in the horizontal direction to the right. When we reach the pinnacle of our flight, our object is not moving up or down for a moment, a brief moment in time. That'll cover everything for Unit 2B. I'll see you in the next one.